Well, thanks, Kent, for the, the introduction, and, and thanks also to Laurel for, for suggesting this program um, at this time. Uh, also, uh, big thanks to Tony Curtis and Whitney Smith in the back, my colleagues at Civil War Governors, who have done uh, a lot of this research that, that we're going to see uh, up here today. This has certainly been a, a group effort in bringing Buffum's story uh, to life. Um, <clears throat> instead of surveying the, the breadth of, of the ways that, that what we would now call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, manifested in, in the Civil War, um, <clears throat> I want to focus on, on one individual here, this man, uh, Lieutenant Robert Buffum. Um, we're going to do three things with him. Uh, first, we're going to tell you his story. Um, we're going to show you what we know about him, talk a little bit about how we know what we know. Um, understand how the war affected him and his family, um, and then finally hear in his own words um, how uh, the war changed him and his life. Second, I want to think about um, what that means, as Kent was saying, for our veterans today. Um, and then uh, third, getting back to uh, that quote that Kent just read, uh, I want to think about what this means for us as a historical society to be active in, uh, in telling these types of stories and then finding solutions uh, for the, the problems they illustrate um, today. <clears throat> so um, before we get into, into what is, is really uh, heavy subject matter, let's start somewhere light. Let's start with Fess Parker. You might have, you might have seen um, uh, the story of Robert Buffum depicted uh, on the, uh, the big screen in Disney's 1956 Great Locomotive Chase. Um, uh, honestly, I was more of a Davy Crockett kid myself, um, is my preferred uh, Parker experience, but, um, but this was, um, uh, was probably the most famous uh, telling of the story that, uh, that we can get at uh, Robert Buffum. Uh, the story opens and closes with a group of, of Union soldiers uh, receiving medals of honor for, for a dangerous raid behind Confederate lines. And the, the narrator, who is, who is not Fess Parker, um, is a man named William Pittenger, uh, who was a member of the raid and, and in fact, is, was a real person. Um, uh, Pittenger then sort of goes into telling the story to uh, President Lincoln and the Secretary of War about why um, they, they are receiving these medals on. These are the first ones that the United States ever awarded to any soldiers um, during the Civil War. And so uh, Pittenger uh, published a, a rather famous book uh, about what would be known as the, uh, the Andrews Raid or the Mitchell Raid. Um, long story short, uh, a, a group of about 20 Union soldiers led by a Kentuckian named James Andrews, who was Fess Parker uh, in, uh, in the movie, um, who was living in Flemingsburg at the time of the war. They decide that they will go uh, behind Confederate lines early in 1862, uh, sneak down to, to Marietta, Georgia, steal a train, um, and drive it back north along the rail lines through North Georgia towards Chattanooga, uh, tearing up uh, rail line and, and, uh, and telegraph line all along the way, disrupting the Confederate war effort so that a, a, a corresponding Union Army strike down into Chattanooga uh, could capture the town, right? That was the plan. Um, as you can tell here, though, it didn't really go according to plan. Um, as, as the title of, of uh, the movie suggests, there was a chase, right? And Confederate um, uh, troops and, and, uh, and engineers got on a train of their own uh, and chased uh, these Union raiders, um, Robert Buffum included, um, up. And they, they almost made it into Tennessee. They almost made it into Chattanooga, but eventually their train uh, ran out of fuel um, in, uh, in North Georgia. Uh, and, and they all scattered. Eventually, uh, the majority of the members of the expedition were captured um, here, uh, led back to the, the town of Chattanooga in chains, um, as you can see there. Um, and, and that is really when their, their horrors began. I'm going to very quickly run through using some of these are illustrations from Pittenger's book um, that he uh, wrote immediately uh, after the raid and then continued to publish in various editions uh, throughout the 19th century. So after having been captured, uh, the men were uh, forced into 
uh, a, a basement dungeon in Chattanooga. This was a Chattanooga slave jail. Um, so they were they were being made by the Confederate authorities to sort of feel the weight of uh, of being in the uh, the Union Army and wanted to uh, to sort of degrade them in that way. Um, while down in there, uh, the men were were absolutely crammed in there, kept continuously chained, um, fed very poorly, um, as you can imagine, vermin and rats and lice and uh, and all of the rest that uh, that you can have. Um, about eight of the members, including James Andrews, were summarily hanged uh, by Confederate authorities in Atlanta. Um, and then the, the rest um, of the, uh, the, the captives were sort of bounced around Confederate prisons uh, for the better part of a year. At one point, a number of them escaped. Uh, they successfully uh, overpowered their guards uh, while they were, uh, were in Georgia. Uh, and uh, and some of them fled. Some of them uh, taking boats and getting all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and l linking up with the U.S. Navy blockading squadron down there uh, to get around um, uh, the Confederate pursuers. Uh, Robert Buffum played a, a very interesting part uh, in this uh, this part of the story. He's actually the one who had the, got the keys and was letting out his fellow prisoners um, in uh, in the uh, escape attempt, which meant that he was the last one left behind and immediately got recaptured and life got so much worse for him. About a year after, uh, after the, the raiders were captured, they were finally exchanged. Um, the Union and Confederate armies often exchanged prisoners, and so uh, the surviving raiders uh, who, uh, who had not uh, been hung or who had not escaped in that, that, uh, that attempt uh, were let back into uh, Union lines. They were awarded the Medals of Honor as the movie sort of wraps back up um, uh, there. Uh, the first ones ever to be getting out, Robert Buffum's was the third given out, but you can, they all happened at the same time. He was just the third guy standing in line um, there. And so I thought that's where the story ended, right? A fairly interesting uh, tale, right? Some soldiers gambled on a ris risky behind the lines mission. It failed. They were honored for their service and their sacrifice um, at the time um, and with the, the Medal of Honor and in ways that, that our culture found uh, more appropriate uh, over time. So this is uh, the National Cemetery in Chattanooga, the state of Ohio, from where the majority of the, the raiders uh, came, uh, erected this monument to the, the men and, and buried around uh, the monument there are all of the men who uh, were hanged or died um, in Confederate captivity. Their graves were eventually moved up there. Um, that was built around 1890 or so. I found out, though, um, that as, as one often does in history, that uh, the story keeps uh, going on uh, after everyone has turned their attention away, right? After the, the American public had turned themselves away from uh, this, this heroic moment where we issue uh, our nation's first medals of honor, these people keep living their lives. Uh, and, and those experiences uh, that, uh, that earned them praise and recognition at the time uh, continue to uh, stick with them. For Robert Buffum's uh, uh, case, he was promoted. He was made a, a, a lieutenant um, and sent back to his regiment after a furlough. Of course, you might understand from being in the prison camp for so long, his, uh, his health was, was absolutely destroyed. Um, and after a few months of recuperating at home, he was originally from Salem, Massachusetts. Um, he moves back up to the front. Uh, with his regiment. And then really his problems start to, to, to manifest themselves. And we see the first evidence uh, of some things that will linger with Robert Buffum for the rest of his life. Um, he is uh, more or less a constant alcoholic uh, from all of the, uh, the evidence that we see. Um, and, and he is, quite frankly, a terrible soldier. Um, he doesn't want to be in camp. Uh, he doesn't want to be stationary. He wants to be active. He wants to be on the move. This is understandable for a man who would willingly volunteer on such a dangerous behind-the-lines mission. And so uh, the best way that his officers, his commanders, are, are able to uh, sort of work with him is to give him that sort of dangerous scouting work. Uh, and so he very successfully for a few months um, leads scouts um, out from uh, the Union Army behind Confederate lines, probing approaches uh, through the mountains. In, uh, in Tennessee and Georgia. Uh, but as soon as he comes back into camp, he falls apart again. Um, eventually, uh, the, the, the camp officers decide we really just can't have him uh, in the unit anymore. And, and, and there is an initial effort to get him court-martialed. Um, but in, in sort of a theme that we'll see coming up again and again, uh, 
the governor of Ohio says, whoa, didn't we just give this guy a Medal of Honor? Are we sure we want to court-martial him? Um, and they say, well, no, that's probably uh, the better plan. And so they allow Buffum to resign his commission uh, and send him home out of the army uh, without facing the indignity of a court-martial. His, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, hammer that, that fell and, and doomed his military career was his, uh, his colonel writing that his character is that of a jayhawker, filibuster, and gorilla with a slight sprinkle of horse thief. In a word, he has left a bad odor with all military predecessors who were here. The Jayhawker is particularly interesting, talking about um, how Buffum's life continues after uh, this raid. His life uh, happened before the raid, too. He had, in fact, been a Kansas Jayhawker, gone out with the, the New England pro or anti-slavery forces, um, established the town of Lawrence. He and his wife had been uh, some of the first pioneers. In fact, his brother had been killed by pro-slavery Missourians outside of Lawrence in 1856. So uh, Buffum has been fighting this broader war in American society um, for, for nearly a decade by the time he leaves the Army in early 1864. Then we came to, the, the, this is actually the way that we, we came to find Robert Buffum. This is in, uh, this is a letter to, to uh, the Secretary of War, which was copied then to our Governor Thomas E. Bramlett. This is found in the Civil War Governors of Kentucky database. Um, and, and long story short, I don't expect you to read it, I just want to show you what was up there. Um, William Pittenger, the man who had uh, written the, the book and by this time was on his first book tour promoting um, the history of the Andrews Raid, finds out that Buffum has been arrested in Louisville um, and had been apparently accused of, of stealing some boots. Uh, and so he's writing, uh, again, in much the same way that we saw earlier, uh, to the Secretary of War and, and says, I do not know whether he is guilty or not, but even if he is, should not his services and sufferings in the nation's cause form a reason for mercy being shown to him now? He has a wife and several small children depending on him who long mourned him as dead while he was in the hands of the rebels and are now almost in despair at this new misfortune. Buffum on his way home from the army in Tennessee was passing through the, the, the rail hub uh, of Louisville before moving up uh, to Ohio to, to finally be discharged from the army. And while he's there, he and a number of friends get into liquor as they had a habit of doing. Um, he wandered down the street uh, to the, the shop of a German shoemaker, uh, left his old worn out army boots there and took a new pair of boots and walked out of the store with them. Uh, and for this, he was sentenced to three years hard labor at the penitentiary over here. Uh, Buffum's wife uh, writes uh, another letter um, herself appealing and, and she says, uh, you know, he was in liquor, which I'm sorry to say, and when he drinks anything since he has been confined and suffered so much in prison, it makes him perfectly senseless. But he is a good, kind husband and father. Oh, sir, after what he has suffered and rendered such services to our government, I cannot feel that it is right that he should be sent away in prison for three long years to come. Tom Bramlett has a tough decision to make. Um, he, uh, uh, quite frankly, is not uh, willing to hear these pleas of Buffum's uh, previous heroism, which is interesting because Bramlett himself had been a military man before he became governor. He's a colonel of the 3rd Kentucky Infantry. Um, but he's also trying to desperately maintain law and order in a state that is quickly spinning off into, into chaos as the war goes on and on. And so he's uh, really not willing to hear these pleas. It's only after... Um, Numerous members of the Lincoln administration, like Edwin M. Stanton, the Secretary of War, like Joseph Holt, uh, the, uh, uh, the Judge Advocate General, and also a Kentuckian, uh, write to Bramlett and, and, and put political pressure on him to say, again, get this war hero out of the penitentiary. Um, that he finally does, and you can sort of see, you can't really see actually because Bramlett has terrible handwriting, um, what he says on the back of this, this envelope that it is, is his official pardon statement, and he says, Although I greatly doubt the propriety of pardoning this man, believing that he is not as innocent as his friends believe, but in deference to the wishes of the Secretary of War, etc., a pardon is granted. Fine. Get him out of the state. These incidents already are raising the questions, these very immediate questions 
um, after demobilization, after soldiers leave a combat zone, after they leave uh, what, what one veteran I know has recently referred to as the cage. Um, what happens when they come home, when they get out of that environment? How do they begin immediately uh, to readjust? Uh, and then how, how does a society embrace both them and their experiences, balancing those two things? What space or latitude uh, does a society owe them? Uh, for what uh, services they have rendered. What do we do when their past come home with them is the fundamental question. Robert Buffum uh, continues to pop up in the historical record uh, for a number of years afterward. The next important point uh, I think is this one. Um, this is copied out of the, the official congressional record from 1868. Don't, don't squint, I'm gonna read it, don't worry. <laughs> um, Robert Buffum is, is writing to, to U.S. Grant, who is by then the acting Secretary of War, <clears throat> and, uh, and says, and I'll just, I'll just read a paragraph here, my present object uh, is to solicit some immediate relief for my family. Congress has never legislated our relief, and some of the surviving of this expedition are suffering for means. He's apparently not the only one who's still trying to come to grips with that experience of a year in Confederate prisons. We believe that our past sufferings and hardships justly entitle us to the consideration of the country, but our families are in a suffering condition and in want of immediate relief. I respectfully ask that the Secretary of War will afford me such relief as will enable me to support my family and procure for them a home. He accompanies this cover letter with about 30 pages of documentation, dep depositions from members of the raid, uh, from uh, the, the, the uh, Joe Holtz uh, report from the Judge Advocate General itself compiled in the immediate uh, aftermath of, of these men being released from prison. All of this justification to put before Congress to get a special pension bill passed uh, to support the members of this, this expedition. Um, and Joe Holt uh, then accompanies this before it even goes to the military committee in Congress. And you can sort of see the tone of, of, of the American government start to change after the war um, as we're trying to deal with an immense war debt. We're starting, trying to deal with, with what has by that time become an insurgency uh, in the southern states led uh, by paramilitary groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. Um, attention has moved away from these veterans uh, in Washington, long story short. And Joe Holt, and this is the little paragraph down there in the, in the bottom right hand corner. Um, instead of endorsing uh, Buffum's petition, he says this. No doubt is entertained of the entire truthfulness of the within statement. While the merit of the heroic and self-sacrificing services which these soldiers volunteered to perform are fully conceded, and the strong claim which they have upon the justice and generous gratitude of the country must be recognized. This is killer. It is not perceived how under existing laws the executive department of the government can afford the relief asked for. Sorry guys, can't do it. And after this rejection, Buffum's life goes into a tailspin. We think about what, you know, who, was, who were the people who were getting government relief at this point. The Civil War did see a fairly robust pension system established at the time that would grow increasingly uh, inclusive of more and more veterans uh, after, uh, in, in decades after the war. Uh, but in 1867, when Buffum uh, was applying, it was still a very narrow category uh, of, of soldiers who the, the government would reimburse uh, for, uh, for their service. So these are some um, stats uh, through sort of the first few decades of, of government pensions after the Civil War. Of course, uh, we might expect uh, gunshots and wounds, uh, incisions, amputations, all of these sorts of things uh, to come out of the war. Of course, the chronic disease, and we all understand the, the misunderstanding at the time of, of modern medical science and the, uh, the destruction that disease wrote through the armies. Uh, all told, we're looking here at about 40% uh, battlefield injury compensation about 60% of those pensions are granted for illness. 0.3% of the pensions that were granted were granted for mental health cases um, like Buffum. And we have to keep in mind that the majority of those mental health cases, um, disease of the brain as it is being termed there, 
uh, were, were the result of other things. You got hit in the head with a musket butt, uh, and so therefore you can make a claim for, for not being uh, fully present. A, a, a fever laid you so low that you are now mentally incompetent to perform the work that you were performing. Um, claims like Buffum's, quite frankly, do not get through. So Buffum himself, we know, um, went to D.C. Uh, to, uh, to petition Congress uh, for this petition in December uh, of 1867. Uh, and and uh, while sort of trying to get a better understanding of what was happening in Congress at the time, Tony found um, this absolutely heartbreaking article. I'll summarize. Long story short, after Buffum went to Congress and heard his claim rebuffed, um, he was uh, wandering back through the streets of a darkened Washington, D.C. Uh, he meets a couple of men, asks them uh, directions back to his hotel. Uh, they say they'll take him, but they would like to go by way of a bar. And Buffum, as we now know, his predilections is not one to turn down a drink, particularly after the day that he has had, you can imagine. After a few hours in the bar of getting liquored up and flashing his wad of cash that he's brought with him from where his family was living near Finley, Ohio, uh, to, uh, to help pay for his trip to get this pension that they so desperately need, uh, the two men spy an easy mark. Uh, Buffum leaves the bar with one of his friends uh, who leads him down a blind alley uh, where he gets mugged, robbed of his $35 in cash and a gold medal that he was wearing for the occasion. Which gold medal do we know that Robert Buffum had? His Medal of Honor got stolen off of him, drunk in an alley in Washington, D.C., while he came to, to pursue a pointless pension claim uh, with the government. This sort of epitomizes Robert Buffum's post-war life. What little we can piece back together of him uh, is, a, is a story of, uh, of attempted uh, um, uh, sobriety, trying to put his life back together, uh, making new promises to his family with the best of intentions, uh, getting a job, joining William Pittenger on some of his book tours, trying to, uh, to make some money off of this, uh, this, this tragedy which befell him while he was in the service, but eventually relapsing back into alcoholism, back into opium abuse, uh, back into uh, strained relationships, to say the very least, uh, with his family, in and out of trouble with the law at one point in Ohio, uh, Buffum was, uh, was in a public place, we're not entirely sure where, but you can guess, um, and, and a man insulted the memory of Abraham Lincoln, uh, and Buffum pulled a pistol out of his coat uh, and shot the man. Uh, fortunately, he wasn't prosecuted for that because uh, the man got better and Buffum uh, skipped town. Eventually, uh, by the late 1860s, he had moved back home to Massachusetts, uh, where at least his, uh, his wife and three children could rely on family support if he couldn't provide for them, uh, and he was committed to the Massachusetts State Asylum. In 1870, uh, Robert Buffum was, uh, was let out. The, the, the uh, keepers of the asylum in Massachusetts said, uh, he goes through periods of sanity and then periods of insanity. Uh, and he appears to be getting better at times, going through this cycle that, that is quite familiar to, to those of us who know addiction in any of its forms today. Um, and during one of his periods of relative sanity, where he seemed to be uh, getting things back together, they let him out. Uh, he went uh, to Newburgh, Newburgh, New York, where a, a friend who had also been in the asylum uh, was living with uh, their father. Uh, eventually, both of them hit the bottle rather hard. Uh, and one night, uh, Robert Buffum uh, left the house before dinner, came back in when the family was seated at the dinner table, calmly pulled a revolver out of his coat, and shot his friend's father in the back of the head at dinner. He was tried in, a, in a, a trial that made headlines across the country, um, as you can imagine. Um, New York Times picked it up, obviously, but we've seen it echoed in the Courier Journal and in papers all across uh, the country. And uh, after, he had, after he'd been captured, he, he offered you know, uh, uh, no resistance to his arrest, calmly let the sheriff lead him away. Um, Buffum tried to commit suicide, we know, a number of times in prison while he was awaiting trial, um, and then sat um, in the courtroom uh, almost dull and lifeless, probably numbed pretty heavily um, with drugs of one kind or the other during the trial. <clears throat> 
as he was being sentenced, uh, eventually to be uh, sent away to, to Sing Sing, uh, Buffum uh, gave uh, a statement. The judge asked him if he would like to say anything um, about himself and, and, and excuse himself for the crimes that he had committed or what have you. This is what he said. I'm going to read most of this because I feel it's, it's really his, his, his most telling statement. This great and terrible war has fetched me where I now stand, but I don't regret my service to my country. Had I a thousand lives, I would give them. I was sent on a military expedition and was in underground dungeons and in iron cages. This is all I can remember because it was written on my heart as if with a pen of fire. I was chained by the neck and handcuffed. We were moved through the South into eight different prisons. Eight of my comrades were executed. You are familiar, all of you men, with my history. I would say this, however, that I am as innocent as the child unborn, for I knew not what I did, referring to that murder. By my service to my country, I have been made a pauper, a lunatic, and a criminal and I place myself in the hands of the great governor of all things who knows all hearts. Robert Ruffham spent about two weeks at Sing Sing. They decided he was not a fit subject to be put into the general prison population. A month later, he was dead by his own hand at the New York Asylum for the Criminally Insane, cut his neck with a razor blade. He was buried in an unmarked prison cemetery, and his body was later moved into a mass grave of former inmates. In 1994, uh, an effort around Auburn, New York, where that asylum uh, was located, uh, was gotten up to place one of the VA headstones in the area where he is believed to be buried. And this is close enough uh, to the final resting place of America's third ever Medal of Honor winner. So my question is, for me, for us, how would we treat Robert Buffum today? Which I think is actually two questions. It's a personal question, and it's, it's a social and it's, a, and it's an institutional question. Personally, what would we think of him? Would we have more understanding and acceptance than he found in the late 1860s? Could we condone, understand, maybe even forgive some of his post-war behavior? The second part of that question, what would we do for him? Would the safety net of, of our VA programs catch him? Or would he end up a statistic in the veteran suicide or the opioid overdose crises? Those questions about how we would treat him, I, I, I can't help but answer, I hope we would be better, but I fear we wouldn't. Robert Buffum served his government bravely, received his nation's highest military honor. Then he reached out to it for help when the burden of that service became too much for him to handle, and he received none. And that was a tragedy for him, that was a tragedy for his family, and that was a tragedy for his victim. And that's too familiar a story today. And that, I feel, is a call to action for us. That's why I do history, right? About the time we were starting to, to really uh, tug on Robert Buffum's story and start to dig up all of these sources, uh, New York uh, Times Magazine published a piece about a young uh, Marine Afghanistan veteran uh, named Sam Ciotta from Illinois. Ciotta had been a, a sniper in his uh, rifle platoon um, and, and had been considered one of the best soldiers um, in his unit uh, while he was in Afghanistan. Uh, one night, in, in a story that, that just so tragically mirrors Buffum's experience in Louisville, uh, after coming home from a bar, he walked into a house next door to his, thinking it was his, um, blind blackout drunk uh, to suppress the demons that were in his head. Uh, and ended up uh, getting in a fight uh, with, uh, with another man who was in the house, in fact himself a former Marine. Um, the trial judge uh, in, uh, in Illinois there uh, said to Seattle something that, that you can almost imagine being said in that court where Robert Buffum was, was convicted uh, in 1871, and he says, this is what the judge said, uh, 
Mr. Ciotta, as an American citizen, I thank you for your service to your country. Your patriotism, your valor, your courage, your heroism. According to those you've served with, you were an exceptional soldier who led by example. Although it is with regret, I'm still required to follow the law and sentence Ciotta to six years in prison for breaking and entering an assault. Everyone thought the case was closed there until uh, some, some members of Ciotta's family discovered his journals that he had kept while he was in Afghanistan, where he had poured out all of the anguish um, over this war um, about being the man designated uh, first to take the first shots um, all the time, to have credited kills to his name, be celebrated uh, for that by men in his unit, uh, and what that did to him uh, as an 18, 19, 20-year-old infantryman. Now that journal was not introduced into evidence um, during his trial. The state laughed off this idea that, that the reason that Seattle was fall down drunk uh, was because he had these demons that came to him every night. Um, but it was introduced into an appeal claim and led by a retired judge from Illinois um, who said, quite frankly, if this case does not call for mitigation, then mitigation has no meaning. The state's attorney who prosecuted Ciotta uh, led the charge for him to be let out of prison um, and, uh, and said eventually, you take a 19-year-old and you put them into this extreme situation where they're being asked to do things, or maybe not asked, but maybe are choosing to do things that are contrary to the values they had growing up. And the U.S. government pats their back and says, good luck. I don't see how that is not a recipe for something to go wrong. But Buffum tells us that this has been a recipe for something to go wrong for a very long time. And that's why we need a historical perspective on the problems that we face today. Getting back to that, uh, that uh, line that Kent read earlier from the piece I published last week, that's why the Kentucky Historical Society is different from other organizations. We are not only an institution of collections, of research, and of learning, but we're an agency of state government. Our mission is not just to preserve the past, but to use the past to address the issues that face the Commonwealth today. We as citizens, we as an agency, have the power and the responsibility to look back at stories like Buffum's. What systems do we have in place now to help our Robert Buffum's, our Sam Ciatas, when they stumble? How can we improve those systems to prevent Buffum's demons, opium, alcohol, suicide, from continuing to kill our servicemen and women after they come home? Draw from one more uh, Civil War example. President Lincoln, in his second inaugural address, one of the most famous lines, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle for his widow and his orphan. Robert Buffum did his service for us, we owe it to him and the thousands of veterans struggling today in every county in the Commonwealth to make sure that their sacrifices are honored with more than medals and monuments in cemeteries. Thanks.